here moving in our midst. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker miracle for here turning lives around. You are here turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are a way maker, miracle worker. Miracle worker, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Paul Lutheran Church. We are, as always, excited to be here to worship God with all of you. As we always, or most of the time do, we're going to begin with our confession and forgiveness, which will be found on our screens. I invite you to stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess, we confess that, we that we have not, not followed your path, path but have but chosen, chosen our, our own way. way. Instead, Instead of putting, putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. table. When, when met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. side. Set, Set us again on, again on the path of life. life. Save, Save us from ourselves and free, free us to love our neighbors. neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. Amen. 
invite you to be seated and we're going to hold off on the children's message. I know there's a couple more that are on their way so I want them to be here for the children's message. So we'll go right along to our scripture readings and we invite our reader to come forward for this morning. Good morning. morning. Our first reading is from Colossians chapter 2, starting at the sixth verse. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the human tradition, according to the elemental spirits 
of the universe and not according to Christ. For in him the full, tr the full, tr the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you live together with him when he forgave us for all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in the matters of food and drink or of observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions, puffed up without cause by the human way of thinking and not holding fast to the head by whom the whole body nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows with a growth that is from God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. In the Psalm, Psalm 138, read responsively, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart, before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down to your holy temple and praise your name because of your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name and your words above all things. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the rulers of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. The Lord is high, yet cares for the lowly, perceiving the mighty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. You will make good your promises for me, O Lord. Your steadfast love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. And we're going to invite the children to come forward now. There are some spaces for you right up in the front. We have a special guest with us this morning. Right over here, Everett, if you would please come to these chairs. Everett, Everett, right over here. Thank you very much. It's been a long time since we've met our special guest, but I'm going to go make sure she's ready to go back here. So come grab a seat, and we'll welcome everybody. Give a round of applause for Princess Persimmon coming out here. Thank you, thank you.
have been cow? Ooh. The princess, yes, I am a beautiful princess. Thank you so much. All right, I love that one, the interrupting cow. I got that from a movie, by the way. I saw that in a movie. But the reason I'm talking about knock-knock jokes this morning is because the Bible says that God is knocking at the door. What do you think that means? When where do we want to accept him? Yes, you guys are so intelligent. Exactly. God is knocking at the door and he wants to come in to live with us in our hearts. But the Bible also says that we can knock at the door. What do you think that means? Exactly. We can also knock and ask God to be with us as well. So it's like, it's a mutual relationship together. We knock asking for God, and God is knocking to us as well. And God wants to be with us every single day to love us and to show us how to love others. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Oh, okay. I have one more for you. How about this? Knock, knock. Woo. Oh, I'm glad you're excited too. <laughs> Pero, not very much though, are you? Let's try that one again. Knock, knock. Who's there? Woo. Woo. Woo, I'm so glad you're excited for Jesus. Okay, one more, one more. Knock, knock. Who's there? Jesus. Jesus Christ, now let me in. <laughs> okay, I have actually one more for you. I'm just kidding. Knock, knock. Let us. Let us pray. Okay, everybody bow your heads. Clasp your hands and let us pray together. Dear God, thank you for this day, for all your love, and for knocking on the door of our hearts. Help us to love as you love. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you so much for coming up and joining me this morning. You can go all the way in the back if you want to hang out back there or go back with your families. Okay, see you later. Bye. Today's gospel reading is from the book of Luke, beginning in the 11th chapter. Glory, Glory to, to you, o Lord. Lord. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. 
and he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who if your child asks for a fish will give you a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg will give a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Give us this day our daily bread. Very interesting that this passage comes up just a week after we had VBS, when that was the main theme of our whole VBS. Give us this day our daily bread. That was what was called our main course for our VBS, which was called the Food Truck Party. And of course, we say these words like almost every week that we gather together here in church in the Lord's Prayer. But sometimes when I pray these words or when I think about them, I struggle a little bit with them. Maybe you have had a similar thought at some point in your life as well. Aren't there people all over the world who don't have their daily bread? Or maybe we could just say daily food. That word in Greek and the same in Hebrew, it can mean just food because bread was so ubiquitous there in the Holy Land that it was, you could equate it to just the general food that anybody would have. Aren't there people every single day who go without their daily food? Or maybe we could extrapolate it even further to just be the daily necessities of life. Aren't there people who go each day without those daily necessities? So many go without. Though I do know that this number has gone down significantly over the last century, and especially over the last few decades, the number of people who are going hungry has consistently gone down throughout the world, but still, there are many who go without. Are they not praying enough? Or praying with enough consistency, enough heartfeltness in their words? Are they not asking for their daily needs to be met? And if they are, does that mean that God is therefore unjust? Is God arbitrary in how God deals with humanity? This goes even into a bigger question, one that theologians have called theodicy. The problem of evil in the world, if God is good and just, how can there be evil? How can God allow evil things to happen? Often we'll blame God for all the evil that happens in the world. Even many who profess not to believe in God will still do this at times. But for the good that is in the world, where does the credit go to? Well, it goes to us, of course, right? We're the ones who cause good things to happen in the world. So then we blame God for the evil and we credit ourselves with the good. It seems a little backwards, doesn't it? In this gospel passage today, Jesus reorients us to what is true and correct. He says, hallowed be God's name. Later on, he says, if you who are evil give bread to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven who is good give you the Holy Spirit? Well, we have it all backwards then. The good is from God, 
and we corrupt that goodness because of the selfishness of our own hearts. Remember at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, the beginning of creation, God said it is good. And then he said it is very good. But we learn very quickly how humans mess it all up. And we continue to mess it up today. How many times have I read that there is actually enough food in the world? There is enough food for every person on this planet to be fed and satisfied many times over. So why do some people not have enough? Not because there is a lack of abundance, but because of human greed or because of wars, political turmoil, religious and other persecution, all sorts of things that do not allow people to have enough. And I know, of course, there are accidents, there are natural disasters, but even so, there would be enough to help people who are in desperate need without humanity's greed. There are enough resources on this earth, enough water, enough air, enough food, enough shelter. There is sufficient for everyone, but we screw it up. So when we are saying, Lord, give us our daily bread, we're not only saying, give me enough for this day, but Lord, don't let me have too much. Give me what I need for this day, but not more than I need so that others will have sufficient as well. I've been hearing a lot in the news lately or reading different articles that, you know, corporations in this country and around the world are making incredible profits right now at a time when many people are struggling mightily, giving huge bonuses to CEOs and And I'm not saying having somebody having more money than somebody else is completely wrong, but you can see the disparity in our country growing and growing and growing over the years. Some have less and less, while some have more and more and more. It seems to be a good example of how this can happen. When some claim more and more and more of the resources, it leaves less for others to have. It's a good example, but really we are all a part of this. If we can all learn to take what we need and not more, perhaps everyone will be able to have their daily bread. It's very easy to say, but it's much harder to do, right? Because of what Martin Luther called in corvatus in se, that selfish nature, us being turned in upon the self, we think about ourselves first That's our natural way of doing things. I read an interesting term recently that psychologists use. It's called the hedonic treadmill. I I think I'm pronouncing that. Hedonic treadmill. It means that we're constantly running on this treadmill of life, but we can never be happy with where we are. We're always comparing ourselves to somebody else. We're always thinking of what we don't have. We're always wanting more and more and more, and so we can never be satisfied. It actually makes sense if you look at the world uh, from a materialistic perspective. If this material world is all there is to life, Why not get as much as you can while you can? If there is nothing beyond this temporal existence, then why not get everything I can get in this brief time of life that I have right now? The Greek philosophers, they debated this question thousands of years ago, and we continue to debate it even today. Many of you know that back in June... It seems a while ago, somehow, the beginning of the summer, I took a week to begin an independent study looking at connections between science and religion, science and spirituality, mainly focusing on physics and neuroscience. A lot of times people see these as being opposed fields of study, but it's something I've been interested in for a long time. I believe that when we look at science and we look at religion and spirituality together, there are actually a lot of ways that they can inform one another. It's something that has helped me in my own faith as well. The more and more that I learn about science, the more and more my faith grows in a God who could create this amazing universe that we live in. 
I think this separation, this, this dichotomy that we create between science and religion is fictional. It doesn't really exist. They can be mutually beneficial for one another. And I'm continuing to study. I hope to be done with my stack of books that I have to read by early next year and then be able to report back and write some papers about my findings. But one of the books that I read so far is an interesting book by a really brilliant scientist. He's a particle physicist named Brian Greene. I've read some of his other books before. It's very fascinating. This book is called Until the End of Time. He talks about the origins of the universe from the Big Bang all the way to what might possibly be, in his understanding, the end of the universe or what will happen at the end if there is such a thing, billions and trillions of years into the future. Brian Greene is a deterministic scientist, which means, generally speaking, that if you could know all of the positions and all of the velocities of all the particles of the universe from the Big Bang onward, then you could basically determine exactly what is going to happen into the future from the creations of galaxies and stars down to the actions of the individual human person. If you could, if you could calculate all of those particles and everything in the universe, you would know everything that is going to happen. Of course, the problem is that we couldn't even calculate all of the particles that make up this sanctuary, let alone calculate all the particles of the universe. But he is deterministic nonetheless. As he gets to the end of the book, describing where the universe might end up according to the calculations that many scientists have, he kind of leaves you with a dissatisfying sense of nihilism. Basically, everything will fade out into complete nothingness with a few elementary particles popping in and out of existence occasionally and that being the only exciting thing that would happen in a vast, possibly infinite, empty space. Everything that we know about and understand would be gone. It would disappear. Even black holes would eventually fade away into nothingness. And that would be it. There would be no purpose. There would be no end goal. What theologians and some scientists call teleology, it leaves one with a profound sense of the futility of it all. Almost a debilitating existential crisis is what I felt upon reading those words. And something that I've thought about in the past, you know, as you're young and you start to learn about the vastness of the cosmos, it kind of makes you feel so small. It can be debilitating in a sense to think about what is my place in the huge vastness of this universe. I can kind of picture it another way. Imagine thinking about your life going to end. Let's say you knew for sure you were going to die in two months. How would that make you feel? It would make you feel sad. You would want to get your affairs in order. You would want to make sure your family is okay, that they are going to be supported going forward. You would still, in a sense, find some sense of purpose and meaning in your life and make sure that you used those last moments of your life to the best of your ability. But what about if you knew that the entire earth and everybody on it was going to cease to exist in two months' time? Wouldn't that change the way you feel about the end of your life? Would you feel a sense of futility in the things that you're doing right now, in the hobbies that you do, in the work that you're doing? If I don't have any children, if there are no ancestors of mine, if there is no humanity going forward, what does that mean for my life? If everything would cease to exist, life as we know it, what is the point of it all? What's the point of me making any more hip-hop music? There's going to be no one to listen to that music going forward or, or writing poetry or finishing my homework for the next test. What is the point of it all if there is no point to it all? If there is no purpose, no end goal, if everything will cease to exist, why even bother? 
for the author, this means, well, we just need to find meaning right now. In the moment, we make our own meaning. This kind of left me feeling sad for this author to truly believe that this is all there is. And eventually, there will be nothing. It's very disheartening. I would find it hard to live my life with any sense of meaning or purpose. I think this materialistic perspective has infected people since time immemorial, causing all sorts of tragedy. Even for those of us who claim to know who God is, it can come back to bite us. We forget about God all too easily in our day-to-day -day lives and revert back to our materialistic selfish natures but God is knocking and we are called to knock at the door as well it's interesting how these two perspectives are both in scripture Jesus knocks to us the door of our hearts and we are called to knock at the door of God as well it is a mutual relationship between us and God. And that is powerful if we stop and think about it. Because of human freedom, because of free will, there is evil in the world. But also because of that free will, that freedom that we have, we can seek after God. We can seek after faith. Even if we can't have faith on our own, which is the reality, oftentimes we cannot have that faith on our own. We can ask God for the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, if God will give us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the one that inspires faith in our hearts. We just have to knock and then accept that Holy Spirit into our lives. And that Holy Spirit will give us faith in the midst of this life that we live. That faith is the key. Faith in God is the key to finding meaning and purpose. Paul said, don't look to the elementary particles or the elementary parts of the universe. In his day, does anybody know what that would have been in the, for the Greek philosophers and, and people during his day? What did they consider to be the elementary particles that made up the cosmos? There's four, four elements, right? I'm hearing it. There's mumbling going on out here. Somebody speak up. Water, air, fire, earth. Exactly. So a lot of people during that day, they said everything that we see is made up of these four elementary particles. Now what do physicists say today? What makes up the whole universe? There's atoms, right? But then atoms get even smaller. You get, uh, well, they got electrons. You can't get smaller than an electron. I mean, that's like zero mass right there. And then you got quarks, right? Quarks make up the protons and the neutrons. They even got something called the gluons, which, which it, it all fits together somehow. And you got the photons, light, right? Light that we see and light we don't see. And you got all these elementary particles, and somebody like our author, Brian Green, will say, that is what makes up everything. That's what brings meaning to the universe. Whatever scientists and philosophers will say that makes up the universe in this day, our faith cannot lie in those things. It must be in God and God alone. That is what I believe. And God is knocking at the door. I got to visit with a member of our church this week, Barbara Luttrell. And uh, Barbara had worked at a nursing facility at one time. And in this nursing facility, there were pictures of Jesus in every room, in every room of them. And she told me a story about one man that she was, she was with, helping out with. And in his room, there was a picture of Jesus knocking at the door. Jesus was knocking at the door, and this man was suffering beyond belief. He was in so much pain from the cancer that had racked his body, and he would cry out. And so they had closed the door of his room so that the other people would not be bothered by his screams and yelling and the pain that he was in. 
At one point, there was a doctor there and Barbara and the chaplain of that nursing facility all in his room. The door was closed. The man was screaming, and he said, can somebody open that door, please, because Jesus is knocking at my door. And the chaplain said, just go and open the door. When they went, they opened the door to his room. Immediately, he felt calm and relaxed. He was able to rest a little bit. And he said that Jesus had been knocking at that door and he needed to let him in. I suppose he had been looking at that picture in his room of Jesus knocking at the door and that it had a great effect on him. And he had remembered that God was knocking, wanting to come in and be with him during this difficult time of his life. Another thing that Barbara told me during her time working at City of Hope was what she saw so many people who suffered mightily with different sicknesses, but it was the ones who had no faith in God, ones who, who lacked a sense of purpose or hope in their own future, they easily withered away, or they struggled and struggled mightily with what they were going through, but the ones who had faith in God, who had hope in their hearts for their future in this world or in the next they were able to persevere through those difficulties. They were able to stay strong somehow with everything that they were going through. Faith is the key. Faith in a higher purpose. Faith in God's purpose. There is more than this materialistic world. There is something more profound. There is something deeper. And when we have faith, we can connect with that higher purpose of God. Florence Shin once said, hope looks forward. Faith knows it has already received and acts accordingly. We are people of faith after all. We need both earthly and spiritual food in our diet. And we know that God is knocking. We are called to knock to God as well. We have that agency given to us by God. And because of God's Holy Spirit in our hearts, we can have faith in God. Faith in a future that is better for us and all of humanity. We have hope in that future. Because of that faith, we can then pray that prayer. We can ask God what we need, our daily bread for each day that we are alive so that all people can then have enough. We can do this because we can trust in that future that God has promised. We can do this. We can trust in Jesus who has called us not only to be his disciples, but who calls us his friends. What a friend we indeed have in Jesus. I invite you to stand as you are able. Let us sing together. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to
Let us now confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the offering. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there's doubt, your faith in you. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there Despair in life, let me bring home. Where there is darkness, only light, and where the sadness ever draws. O oh, Master, grant that I may never see to itch to be. Soul is to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of your peace. It is in part of me. That we are pardoned in giving of ourselves that we receive, and in dying that we're born to eternal life. Let us pray. <clears throat> God of abundance. You have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. I invite you to remain seated or kneel as you are able for the prayers. Let us pray to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of the church, the world, and one another. God, we give uneasy thanks for prophets and martyrs. They're hard to listen to, much less imitate. We give you uneasy thanks for the times you test our faith. Keep reminding us that your grace is sufficient and the inheritance you have stored up for us in Christ is eternal. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our give bishops, pastors, and theologians the courage and faithfulness of John the Baptist. Give special strength and joy to Pastor Nate for his faithful and creative work, drawing us to repentant faith. Lord, in your mercy, 
keep St. Paul faithful to our mission, sharing a living, daring a confidence in God's grace. Make our words winsome, our actions gracious, and our lives lovely so others want to meet the God we love. Lord, in your mercy. Bless us during our summer vacations, delighting in the wonders of an actual summer vacation. Lord, in your mercy. Bless the work of all who apply faithful work and intelligence to consistently supply essential utilities during shortages, fires, and heat waves. Send special blessings to those who use their vast knowledge to monitor our HDL, LDL, triglycerides, aches and pains, and gently apply healing and compassion. Lord, in your mercy. God, we thank you for the imperishable inheritance given to us in Jesus. Thank you for the promise of everlasting life. Thank you for fulfilling your promises to all who die trusting them. Give us strength to trust your Son completely, to confess boldly, and to rejoice always. We pray silently or aloud, the names we know need healing and strength. For Janine, Yvonne, Stan, Ning, Russ, Barbara, Marge, Chuck, Brent, Mary, Marilyn, Clyde, Leslie, Bob, Ronald, Noel, Margaret, Sarah, Andrea, Alice, and Lydia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring us with all the redeemed into your kingdom, where with your Son and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, God forever. Hear and graciously answer our prayers, dear Lord, as it is best for us and most glorifies your holy name. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let's share a sign of that peace with one another. <coughs> the 7th of August. That was the only date I think that worked for her. Okay. So. But that, because that's not in here. That's oh, oh, here. add it. Okay. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> My mic is on. <laughs> Whoever's online is hearing everything I'm saying. <laughs> We invite you to start making your way back to your seats for our announcements this morning. We've got to get those announcements before we can head on our way. So we do want to give thanks to Henry and Lydia Enriquez for the flowers that are on either side of our altar. Thank you so much. 
and uh, God's blessings to you. And also, we have a, another rose on the altar, and this is in celebration of the birth of Todd and Maria Shaw's fourth granddaughter, Ava Maria Shaw. So congratulations to you, God's blessings uh, for your new granddaughter and for her life in God's love. We also have some more announcements for you. This week, we're going to be going on a trip with our high schoolers, but the week after that is going to be our music camp, and that is for second grade and up. There is still time to sign up. It's going to be an awesome week with Chris and Damaris and Greg leading, teaching lots of new songs. It's going to be a lot of fun. So it starts on August 1st. It goes through Friday of that week from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. There's still time to get signed up for that. We also still need some more worship assistants to be greeters and ushers and readers for the rest of the summer. There is a sign-up sheet as you are leaving. We'd love to have you join in leadership during worship. Rally Day is coming up. It's a little ways away, but it's going to be on the 11th of September. Just wanted you to know that. It is in your bulletin right here as well. And for July donations for Pathways of Hope, there's still time. Any breakfast foods will be accepted. And for Operation Christmas Child, we'll be collecting crayons and ballpoint pens. Also, just recently there was planned a swim and study. That's going to be happening at Diana Box House, and it's going to be on August 7th, right? So look for more information to come out about that swim and study time for our young ones in the congregation. It'll help them get prepared back going to school and to have some fun together as well. Is that correct? <laughs> you were looking at me a little strange. Right. I thought maybe, uh, maybe not. Okay, any other announcements for the good of the people? People's Roundtable is happening today. Every fourth Sunday of the month, meeting in the youth room, be gathering from 2 to 4 p.m., talking about important issues of justice, for our community, and for our world. So come and join us from 2 to 4 p.m. right in the youth room today. This is the fourth Sunday of July, so it's happening today. And then it'll be the 28th of August. We'd love to have more voices join in and talk about these important issues. So please come and join us for that. Any other announcements? All right, we're going to invite our high schoolers to come on down those who are able to be here this morning, we are having our youth trip. As you probably know, the national youth gathering that was going to be this week, we were actually going to be leaving today. It got canceled um, for reasons of COVID and whatnot. And so we created, yes, you too, Damaris, do come forward. You're, you're part of the trip. So we created our own youth trip. There's going to be more youth going, but not all of them could be here for today, but we wanted to ask all of the congregation to be involved, that you pray for our youth and for our leaders during this trip. It's going to be five whole days, starting Monday morning, tomorrow we meet here early at the church, and we'll get back Friday evening. Um, we're going to Sequoia National Forest, and we'll be camping at Lake Silverwood, and then the last day we're going to be going to Raging Waters and having a good time with all the youth. And, uh, and we'll try and survive this week of excitement as well. <laughs> so keep all of us in your prayers, especially our youth who are going. And I'd invite you to stand as you're able, and we'll just have a prayer before we get sent on our way. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for this day, and we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to travel with our youth, to learn more about your love and your grace in our lives and the natural world that you have created and how that points us to you. Be with us as we journey. Keep us safe along the way and help us all to come back and have a wonderful service next Sunday together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Also, I forgot to mention as I was praying, next Sunday's service is based on the theme of our whole week, which is journeying with the Psalms of Praise. 
So our youth are going to be the ones leading our whole next service and sharing about what they learned and the scripture passages. So we are definitely excited. They might be a little nervous, maybe, maybe not, but sharing, and I'm definitely excited to hear what they have to say next Sunday. So please come and join us and support them in that. Do you want to, anybody want to say anything else? So they were very happy and excited to see Princess Persima. And so they made uh, like a little Don't back away from the <laughs> post and they want to show it to you and explain what they did if that's okay. Yeah, come on down. No, you guys stay up here. You, you got to stay up. You got to walk out with me. You're a part of it. All right, awesome. Do we have a microphone? Oh, thank you so much. Let's have everybody sit down now, since we're, all these unexpected, wondrous things. Is that one on? Yeah, they're both on. Are they okay. both on? Yep. Okay, so this is what we did in Sunday school today. Um, so they all had a meet with uh, Princess, what was her name? Persimmon. Persimmon, Persimmon. Um, and so they are all going to explain what they did. And um, so that's the door, and that's Jesus with the little bow tie coming through the door. <laughs> all right, all right. There we go. Um, the earth is the, um, um, the earth is where Jesus is coming through the door from. Here, we have a cheese moon, because everybody knows that, earth, that the moon is made of cheese. I um I drew the the beautiful door the doors I put a uh, knock knock jokes that princess Persimmon said So we're going to put it in the bag if you want to see it closely but they were very excited to share what they did I love, it. I love it. Thank you guys so much. Now, since you guys are up here and I'm going to invite our high schoolers to come back up, why don't you all, let's say the benediction for the day together so we can send everybody on their way. You guys stand as you're able. You can find it on the screens right there, okay? One, two, three. Go into the world bold in God's relentless love. Insured by the healing touch of Jesus and invigorated by the metamorphic Holy Spirit. Amen. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go
in peace, love your neighbor. Thanks be to God.